Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members and the Ambrose Dini family in the gallery, thank you for the many kind words that have been spoken to me, to my party, and to the family of the Honorable Mario Oriani Ambrosini since his passing on Saturday. We have been flooded with tributes to a man who clearly made a deep impression on many lives. From citizens who appreciated his fight on their behalf against the secrecy bill, to his holiness, the Dalai Lama, on behalf of the Tibetan people, from service officers in parliament to ambassadors, journalists, students, and lovers of freedom everywhere. Tributes and words of thanks have abounded for the good doctor. We in the IFP feel this loss deeply. Dr. Ambrosini was a national treasure, but one of family rooted, of course, in his party, the Inkata Freedom Party. His loyalty to me, to the party, never wavered. This was his home. We were a family. Today I weep for the loss of a son. When the history of the Fourth Parliament is written, it will no doubt be said that the Fourth Parliament of South Africa was a number of Zini Parliament. It was characterized and often even shaped by his actions. At the first sitting, of the Fourth Parliament, the Honorable Dr. Ambrosini rose for the first time in this house, but not to deliver a maiden speech or a member statement. He rose on a massive point of order, which he had given to the Speaker in advance, challenging the validity of the rules of Parliament. That set the scene for a three-year court battle, pitting the principal conviction of one man against the established authority of the Honorable Speaker of the National Assembly, no less the son of our icon, Mr. Walter Sassoon. The Honorable Dr. Ambrosini acted for no financial gain and certainly at risk of tremendous financial loss. But he acted on principle. And when it came to principle, Dr. Ambrosini was like a pit bull. Many feared failure and advised him to surrender even in the IFP. But he saw it through all the way to the Constitutional Court and won for every member sitting in this house today and to every member who will sit in these seats in the future the right to introduce legislation in the National Assembly. He kicked open a door for all of us to do our jobs better and the need to do our jobs. The last sitting of the fourth parliament was dedicated to a debate on cancer treatment, which the Honorable Dr. Ambrosini had called and led. He was already months into his own journey of fighting terminal lung cancer, diagnosed out of the blue in April 2013. This, he said, was not a fight he chose, it chose him. But true to character, he drew his own battle lines and took this disease not only for his own survival, but with the goal of destroying the grief of cancer entirely for everyone. He studied and researched, engaging the best minds and didn't shy away from using his own body for experimental treatment wherever he felt there was plausible science to support hope. What he sought was an alternative treatment to the mainstream, for he realized that the current scientific paradigm around cancer had been proven wrong by his failure to save millions of lives. The question then can be asked, did he succeed? He extended his life far beyond the prediction of doctors. He maintained a quality of life when he should already have been dead. And he maintained clarity of mind right up to the end. He was able to make his own decisions consciously and fully recognizant of all the consequences. He was able to spend quality time with friends and loved ones. His memory remained exceptional, and his thoughts and emotions remained at his own command. 
Countless families have watched their loved ones suffer the ravages of conventional cancer treatment, unable to communicate or share quality time in the last days and weeks. I believe they might rightly say, yes, he succeeded. He also succeeded in showing us the way to another door that needs to be kicked open, and he provided the method to do it. Through his medical innovation bill, he showed us how to help all these families and all the families who would endure this tragedy in the years to come by empowering them to choose their own treatment and empowering the best medical and scientific minds to research and try alternatives. His death was not a failure. He waged the most courageous battle anyone could have waged, and he displayed bravery beyond measure. He was a courageous man indeed, very courageous, reminded of one of his kinsmen, Garibaldi, who had the heart of a lion by the brains of an ox. But you remember he had the heart of a lion and also the brains of a genius. Over the past three days, Honorable Deputy Speaker, out of respect for Dr. Ambrosini's family, I made no statement about the circumstances of his passing. Because of my close friendship with Dr. Ambrosini, the family informed me on Saturday morning of the circumstances. However, this was not a party matter. It was for the family to determine their own timing. Dr. Ambrosini's wife, who is present with us in this house today, Karin, has now agreed that I speak openly as his lifelong friend and leader. Honorable Speaker, Honorable Deputy Speaker, Honorable Ministers, Honorable Deputy Ministers, Honorable Members, and the Ambrosini family, it is with deep pain that I make this statement. In a characteristically clearly considered an enunciated decision. On Saturday morning, the 16th of August, 2014, Mario Caspari Oriani Ambrosini decided to end his long and hard fought battle with cancer and the unbearable pain and suffering he had to endure towards the end. There was no further hope of cure, remission, or improvement. He had tried every alternative, including conventional treatments, and was faced with the imminent failure of his body in many respects. It had already failed, including his lungs, his mobility, and his eyesight. He was not able to eat and was dependent on an oxygen machine. Many times over the past few weeks, Dr. Ambrosini told his closest friend that his greatest source of suffering was not his disease, but was the knowledge that his family were facing a harrowing journey to his inevitable death. Knowing him as well as I did, I believe that his decision was made out of compassion for his family, his son, his wife, his mother, his sisters and brothers. In his last moments, Dr. Ambrosini sent a message to a few of his closest friends describing his physical condition and saying farewell. He wrote, I'm dying in peace and serenity, surrounded by the love of my family and friends. I'm dying at a time when I feel ready. I feel in the grace of God and part of his passion, and in that sense, relieved and saved. My last thoughts are with my child, and I hope you may give him some of the love and guidance I would like, I would like my child to receive. Thank you for your friendship and love, which I feel with me at this time, unquote. For a few days to come, Dr. Ambrosini's death will be spoken about, and the tragedy of, tragedy of the circumstances may overshadow thoughts about his life. But I know that with this time, this sad end ending will hardly be remembered for it will be outweighed beyond measure by the memory of his remarkable life. The fourth parliament began and ended with bold moves by Honorable Dr. Mario Ambrosini. And the chapters between 
were filled with dramatic and important initiatives. I wish to express my, our appreciation for the fact that Advocate Robin Strunsham Ford, who walked this long, painful journey with him, is with us as we pay this tribute to his friend, companion, and fellow sufferer. Let us honor him for founding of the Parliamentary Institute of South Africa with Dr. Zola Squeya, His Excellency, our former ambassador, the Honorable Deputy Minister in Coast Patekile Holomisa, the Honorable Professor Kara Asmal, our former minister, the Honorable Dr. Wilmot James, and other outstanding leaders. Let us remember that he was the main engine behind the recurring actions to vindicate the wrongful denial of a visa to His Holiness, the Dalai Lama, which brought to Parliament many member statements and the torch of freedom. He was the kingpin of the cooperation amongst opposition parties, which led to the Collective for Democracy. He worked relentlessly to make it a reality from the design of the, of the logo to the organization of parliamentary rallies. He became the champion of the struggle for freedom of the press and a warrior against the secrecy bill. He brought to South Africa the first filibuster. We stopped the passing of the bill for five months, enabling civil society to reconstitute its action and refocus its pressures. He created the political space which enabled Black Tuesday to occur. He single-handedly conducted many battles through the ideology of libertarianism. As a matter of principle, he opposed the provocation of forcing the labeling of goods coming out of the occupied territories in Israel. He was voted the Parliamentarian of the Year in 2016 by the Sunday Times, only followed by the Honorable Mr. Mania of the DA and the best dressed parliamentarian by GQ magazine. But among his many accolades, the one held dearest was his appointment by the speaker to the wine cellar committee, <laughs> which as he used to say, was the only position in parliament which required dedicated skills and knowledge. <laughs> All this was just the tail end of his life. He will be remembered as one of the key negotiators in our transformation from apartheid to democracy. I admired his skill in negotiations, and I want to honor him for what he achieved by remembering just one part of it. Dr. Ambrosini's guidance and mastery of transitional law enabled the IFP to secure provinces for South Africa. He conducted a complex negotiating game which we won. In September 1993, the interim constitution was finalized without the inclusion of provinces, but provision was made for the Commission of Rationalization within the Constitutional Assembly, which would have decided within two years whether we should have provinces, states, or regions. We forced provinces to exist in the interim period, which the ANC ruling party today agreed to, because the rationalization process was centralizing all powers within the same time frame of two years. Therefore, the list of powers given to provinces seemed meaningless, as there were mere promises which the Constitutional Assembly could have taken away. Dr. Ambrosin negotiated the list of powers with the Honorable Mr. Vali Mosa, whose mathematical mind identified that there was no problem in giving as much as Dr. Ambrosini wanted, because it was all going to the central government in the interim and could have been taken away by the Constituent Assembly. In the next stage of negotiation, we forced the adoption of the all-important constitutional principle that the power of provinces could not be diminished. By the same token, together with Professor William Olifir, Dr. Ambrosini drafted the Ngonyama Trust Act, which took the bits and pieces of traditional land in Wazulu that remained under the king in Amakosi after the, our dispossession by the colonialists out of the pro process of rationalization which would have led to it becoming state land and place it under a regionally based trust under the control of the king and his Amakosi. And we honor the government for allowing a judge of the higher court, Mr. Jerome Gwanya, to, to chair, to assist the king. This 
colleagues, was my last act as we would wound up because of the legislature. Later, as advisor to the Minister of Home Affairs, Dr. Ambrosini did the work of two. With Professor Corbus van der Rohen, he drafted the film and publication control law to eliminate censorship, a censorship which is now being reintroduced. He was the grand architect of the reform of the immigration system in terms of providing South Africa with the skills that our country needed. This was a life too vast, Honorable Deputy Speaker, to capture in so short a time. Let me therefore leave his many achievements aside for now and speak about his character. This great adopted son of South Africa. We all know of his brilliant mind, his intellect and talent, both as a constitutional lawyer and as a member of parliament. Many of us know that Dr. Ambrosini was a complex man given both to fiery displays of anger and overwhelming acts of magnanimity. Those of us who are privileged to know him well know that he was both gentle and fierce, compelling and kind. He had a wonderful sense of humor. He was deeply loyal and cared profoundly for his friends, always seeking their best interests. He was an old style gentleman, noble and brave. I wish we had more in this house, Deputy Speaker. I count it the greatest privilege, honorable ministers, honorable deputy ministers, honorable members, my colleagues, as my greatest privilege of my life to have had Dr. Mario Ambrosini at my side as my friend and advisor. I therefore ask only, ask only what he asked himself, that in the years to come, those of us who are blessed with his friendship will find ways to bless his son, look, look who is with us in this house. Let us tell Luke what a wonderful man his father was, what a great man his father was. Look, your father was South Africa's greatest adopted son. On behalf of my party, my family, I extend condolences to the family of Dr. Mario Ambrosini, who are here in the house. I thank them for all that they did for our warrior and friend. May they now take comfort in the words of St. Paul in the letter he wrote to the Thessalonians, first chapter five, verse nine to 11. For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us. And whether we wake or sleep, we should live together with him. Thank you. Thank you, Honorable Member.